um, calling us to order at 6 35. Uh, yeah, welcome everyone. Um, this evening we've got a little bit of business to attend to. And um, first up is public comment. Um, we have none. We have none. All of our guests have reserved slots on the agenda. <clears throat> so the public does not have to talk before our meetings? They're um, welcome to. Well, I mean, we I thought him. maybe Steve would be here. Since he's going oh, I don't know. There. He's not. He's not. We're uh, moving already to our third agenda item. Look at this. It's the approval of the minutes of December 21st. This says 2020. That's got to be. I found the first correction. I, I yeah, I, I corrected that also. He already caught it. Beautiful. Uh, and I just and, posted a correction into the chat window. Uh, John's last yep. name is spelled block B L O C H, not B L O C K. All righty, good catch. It sounds like people have already um, yep. done a scan at least. Um, we maybe just give it a minute of. of Further scanning before we uh, call the question on approval of the minutes. Yep. Oh, we've already had, uh, two items noted. This was the story right before the holidays meeting that we managed to get a form for. Look at that. That's a job or two. So it'll be John Black with an H studio. Uh, yes, speak of that. And that is actually happens twice, but it's a single fix. A common mistake too. When we uh, when we bless the studio, we have the flat part. Yeah. Yeah, we're we're ah. looking forward to finally having an open house. Um the date and John Block's spelling are um amendments yep. or fixes to the the uh minutes. Any other any other um Fixes to note, grammatical content, spelling, any and all. Um, but the, that may be it. I, I could also entertain a motion to accept. I'll move to accept the minutes as stated incorrectly. Um, Dave has moved that we accept the minutes as corrected. And if there's a second. We'll have a motion on the table. Or it's a discussion item and we're still scanning for hours. You said you'd, she'd make it remotely. They may just be a studiously. Just um, a compliment to uh, Mike Gabadi. Not part of the meeting, but Mike, great job in getting us uh, coordinated ahead of time in the reminders. Much appreciated. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I hope I wasn't pest-like, but yes. Um, we're seeking a quorum on email, and I know a lot of people are much more text um, responsive. So I, no, it, it, I think it's terrific. I also appreciate you're giving us a chance to rescan the minutes. Um, much appreciated also. Just I realize and, it's not and, really uh, appropriate to be part of a meeting, but just, hey, it, it's really working well. So that, that gets us back on topic. Um, Dave uh, has so moved that we approve the uh, to approve the minutes as uh, uh, amended, and we're looking for a second. Second. Okay. Uh, thank you, CJ. CJ seconds Dave's motion. Um, <clears throat> all those in favor of approving the December twenty first, twenty twenty one minutes with the uh, date correction and John Block spelling. Last name correction. Please so indicate by saying aye. 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 And opposed would be nay. 
All right, that's unanimous consent of the uh, minutes of December of last year. Check. Item four is um, new board members. And um, our last meeting, we determined a process that uh, we, um, Dave, it was your idea for, um, for me to just pick up the phone and have a conversation with both um, Chad, last name, thank you. Irvin. Irvin and Rachel. Muse. Thank you. Um, they, they both are, uh, I, I think we just kind of got extremely lucky. They, they, they both have uh, the kind of strengths we've been looking for. Um, Rachel's um, director of the library in Waterbury and that town has been, you know, it's a, a boom town culturally. And it's in our catchment area, and we have just we haven't had a Waterbury member since. Oh my goodness, it might have been you know the Obama years. Um, so, and uh, you just you just asked really great questions about um, the direction and challenges um, that public access media is facing. So, um, yay! And then Chad is is already um, as as uh, someone who who is a filmmaker and speaking to people in uh the public television where you are that looks like a really great lead for a grant i mean you've got your ear in places that we really are psyched and could really use ears so um and that reminds me rob is that action you feel like that that grant lead was actionable uh from maybe a month ago three weeks ago you sort of bounced that to us on an email i can't remember which one it was I it was um it was a grant helping non so that nonprofits could tell their stories, but potentially ORCA oh, could be a, a helper mm -hmm. of storytellers. The Arts Council, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I was I had, since then have actually was bringing up the um, community media uh, as a resource in a meeting with Molly Gray and some people with the legislature. I think it was last week, so I was trying to remember if I told you about that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Which one was it? So I'm sorry. I, I was just trying to get the link for Sue who's saying that your boss is concerned. Got it. Got it. Can you? Uh, um, just, just that um, uh, Chad has already shared up a, 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 some potential grant money. Yeah. For the Arts Council. And I don't know if that, that you know, I'm the lead or Chris the lead. Christopher would take you on that. So I, you know, okay. I can check again to see what he, if he's done anything with that, but I don't have any, anything to report on that. Okay. Um, and then in terms of process, um, we would need a motion to welcome um, Chad and Rachel to the board. Um, there may be folks who are not at the last board meeting who may have questions or just, I don't know if you guys want to kind of spit out your resume or process wise. Um, I, I would say the, the floor is open if people want to ask questions or if I would love to hear um, more about your discussion with the chair or just what draws you and what's part of your vision for ORCA, if uh, people have the time and welcome. Thanks for being willing to serve with us. That's it. That, thank you. That's a really nice framing. Um, so you want to yeah, the I'll get started. Um, so I'm Rachel Muse. I'm the director of the Waterbury Public Library, where I've been for about six months. Uh, prior to that, I was a manager at Fletcher Free Library in Burlington. Um, but for years I worked at the Vermont State Archives in Middlesex and I actually live here in Montpelier right down the road on College Street uh, and served on the board of the Kellogg Hubbard Library for about nine years. Um, and I will tell you when Rob first approached me about this I was a little bit um, thinking, what does that have to do with libraries? That's a little bit baffling. <laughs> uh, but I was very curious and intrigued right away. Um, and I uh, jumped on the ORCA website and immediately read the mission statement. I said, oh, this is all about information access. Uh, this is about public information getting into the hands of the people who need it. That's exactly what libraries are about. This is actually a really, really logical partnership. Um, and uh, Rob and I have also been talking about uh, some work that could be done in Waterbury, getting um, uh, cameras and editing equipment into the hands of the public there giving them some, some training and getting them out there in Waterbury, uh, recording some potential, potentially really interesting things. So uh, 
So that's where I come from. I, I will admit I, I'm still learning. I had a great conversation with Mike about um, Orca and uh, especially sort of uh, the future and some of the challenges that, that face uh, this type of media. Um, and that only made me a little bit more intrigued and curious to see what I could do to help out. Rachel, our board is neither of you so long. <laughs> it's very nice to have your board. One only question I have is, does the Waterbury Library still have all the stuff that got underwater in the last flood and is it all dried out yet? <laughs> we, what we have is a, because of the last flood is a, a beautiful new building that was built in 2016. So if you haven't been to the library, um, it's gorgeous. So you don't have to wait for what papers? No, thank goodness. So we have a new, clean, and actually much of the library collection was on the upper floors and, and wasn't damaged in the flood. That but, was a miracle. Uh, yeah, it really was, but the, the building itself took a hit, and that's yeah. why we have the new building now. So, yeah. I'm happy to see you here. And happy to be here. Thank you. Um, further questions or conversation for Rachel? Ms. Muse, I should say. Okay. Chad, you may have the floor. Thanks, here. Rachel. Thank you. Reintroduce yourself to some of us and some of us who are meeting for the first time. Uh, my name is Chad Irvin. I um, live here in Montpelier. Uh, I have a video production company with my wife here in town called Well Told Films. And um, I've been working in filmmaking and television for about 20 years. So that's what I know lots about. Um, we, since, uh, struggling to meet other people who make television and film here. I've started an organization called the Vermont Production Collective to network and organize people in television and film and graphic design production work in the state and have been making a lot of progress on that. And so that sort of around my work with that is what led me to Orca um, in that part of one of the things that I envision is, is um, creating pathways for people to get from the point where you're graduating or interested in learning about television, video production work to a more professional level for one thing. And another thing is that I feel like the community media um, provides a great resource for, for teaching opportunities like they're doing at Media Factory. And also potentially providing resources for people who are uh, production making things in the community, uh, the resources like the studio, but also the edit suites and stuff like that, that I think are really underutilized. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think, um, that, that's the main thrust of it. Um, at my strong focus is around, um, Selfishly, uh, maybe for, for film and video people, like developing more community. And I feel like this sort of hub is exactly the sort of thing that can, has existing resources that should be built around and utilized um, here in central Vermont and with the other um, uh, community media uh, outposts around the state. Uh, so. Chad, where are you, did you and your wife get your, uh your start in the whole production of uh, productive collective and filming and documentaries and stuff. <laughs> well, that was a while ago. Um, I mean, <laughs> the very, very start, I was delivering videotapes and um, writing scripts on the side down in Miami. Oh, and they said, uh, you know, I think the producer got sick. And they said, hey, Jack, can you write a script about football? And I said, Sure, I can write a script about anything. <laughs> and I think it's like 22 years old. And they said, all right, here you go. And uh, so then I started directing and producing and learned to edit. And through learning to edit, got connected with PBS in Boston and made uh, national programming for uh, PBS and film fests and uh, stuff like that for the last 10 years or so. I have one related question. Was Claudia at the Big Picture Show planned to have her documentary festival this uh, winter? 
The what, which one? What is that? Claudine that runs the big picture show and is married to the director. Uh, I don't know. I okay, do know that the for a while I had every year a documentary festival. Big picture show. I'll have to connect with them. I was We're talking with, with uh, the Vermont BTIFF with Orly there about their plans for the May Here Fest in April, which oh, is scheduled good. to go, go, go. Here, it's really amazing. It's crazy. Um, further questions or conversation for Chad? Those were nice. Assume it may not. We're good. Um, Great intro. I love your uh, accidental tourist approach to becoming a filmmaker. Very cool. Our scriptwriter. Um, <laughs> do you do you think, as part of the board, um, you might be able to help make some of everybody's talents available? Like what I'm wondering is, and forgive me, this perhaps should be under new business, but um, maybe at our open house, one thing we could do if the board is willing, because this is not necessarily part of a board's job description, is to say, here's what we do. And we will have like, you know, we, we would be willing to make our skills available on, you know, on a preparatory basis. Maybe we schedule a regular thing to the public. And then maybe they are not the least bit interested. But maybe they say, yeah, we'd love to do that. Like you're, you know how to write scripts. Uh, I, know how, I know how to fly airplanes. Um, and, uh, you know, other people have other skills, you know, would, would, so I guess this is for the open house discussion, but. I had, yeah. a, I had a similar thought under, um, uh, it might be new or old business, but I, I like, I like how you're thinking CJ, um, in, in terms of our, um, potential board members, we would need a motion. I imagine by the cleanest is two separate motions for two separate people. Um, and uh, there's some conversation people would like to further have before that happens. Wonderful, but just uh, I do hope we're headed to an action item. And as a, as a uh, board chair, I can't actually move the ball. Yeah. <laughs> so moved for both. Uh, so I make two motions. Um, move to accept. I, I, I appreciate that. You can do a two in one motion. So those are two separate motions forwarded as one piece. Well yeah. done, CJ, in the interest of efficiency. Um, anyone a, a second on um, the uh, ratification of uh, a pair of excellent board members? I'll second. Thank you, Rachel, Ms. Feldman. Um, and with uh, a, a motion and a second on the table, um, uh, any further discussion? And then I'll call the question. If not, um, all those in favor of welcoming Chad and Rachel um, to the ORCA board meeting, as of this moment, I do believe you would have some voting privileges <laughs> Uh, uh, <laughs> indicate by saying aye. 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 They don't have voting privileges yet, <laughs> but they will in a moment. Right. right. Uh, thank you. Yes. I'm seeking to qualify you. But back to the future. <laughs> um, and uh, opposed would be nay. And that sounds like unanimous consent. Congratulations and thank you for, um, you know, this is a, it's a volunteer job. There is pizza, um, but uh, we've just, <laughs> We've just strengthened our board immensely. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, okay. Congratulations. Thank you. You're here. I hope they weren't holding off on pizza before they got ratified. That will move us to item five. Um, Ed Jones presentation. I'm sorry I didn't catch your name. I'm Michael, but thanks for your patience. Um, and uh, I don't know, Rob, if you want to do introductions. Yeah, let me do a quick, uh, uh, brief introduction, uh, just so the board, new board members know. Yep. Um, you will have in the packet I uh, gave you the budget uh, from last year, which can give you a sense of what our annual budget is. Um, but one of the things that we is not in there is on our uh, what would be considered a balance sheet would be, uh, and, and when we get to the financial report, I'll do, I will talk about how much we have in our accounts at the bank. But we also have uh, an account with Ed Jones uh, that is our reserve funds. 
uh, which has been um, growing over the years. Uh, and through the good work of our treasurer, who is not here tonight, Mike Doyle, who uh, uh, really did sort of uh, envision the idea of being able to put some of this money in reserve and have it make money for us. Uh, and it's come to a lot of help. Uh, and in fact, it's gotten um, bigger. Uh, and so um, when uh, Mark, who is with us tonight, uh, took over at Ed Jones. Uh, I got the chance to meet with him on a regular basis. We've probably been on a handful of meetings and he's taking me through some of the the uh, nomenclature, some of the different terms of uh, how to understand uh, um, finances and our portfolio. Uh, and we did talk about the fact that it would be great to have him come and introduce himself to the board uh, and talk about some of the things that we've been talking about in our meetings. So Mark, and I apologize, I don't, I've forgotten your last name, Mark. So if you want to just have uh, introduction. It's Gwyn. Gwyn, thank you. So G it's all yours, Mark. G Y N N. G W I N N. If anyone's writing it down. Um, Hang on. Yeah. So first, uh, does anyone have questions at all? Where are you? No. Uh, at the moment, I'm in Montpelier, just behind the college. Um, and my office is on stone cutters down there between Sarducci's and the co-op, but I'm at home right now because it's so late. Um, I just want to know where you hang out during the work. Yeah. Week. That's, that's pretty much it. Home and work. That's it. <laughs> um, so as for what the purpose of the money is, how you guys can use it, I don't speak to any of that. But what I can help you with is um, what is it invested in? And then once you can help me identify what the purpose of it is, then I can help give you recommendations on how much risk versus reward there should be in there. So for anybody who knows nothing at all, I'll go very quickly. Think of in terms of things, think of things in terms of stocks versus bonds. And stocks are the gas that make the thing go and grow. Um, and bonds are the safety equipment that keep the thing on the road when things go twisty and sideways, right? Right now, your portfolio is roughly a 50-50. Um, now, Michael and I met and talked, and I know Michael had a lot of history and love with this, with this account, um, and he was not very interested or not too concerned with what you were investing in. It was mostly about the performance and watching the thing grow. And um, I've, after speaking with him and after speaking with Rob, um, I wondered if the board makeup now might be different than it was when this thing was created over 10 or 12 or however many years ago. Um, and if, if what the money is doing while you're not using it might be something that is important to you. And if it's not, then it's fine. It's an easier job to just look at, well, we need so much stock and out of those stocks, so much of this type, so much of that type, and same thing with bonds, and then let's just watch it grow. Um, but the questions that, I, I have some questions for you as a board, if I may, and you don't have to have answers for them now. I'm just gonna throw the questions out there. But um, one of the things that Rob and I had talked about was, is there an interest in greening up and cleaning up the contents of your portfolio. Um, if there is, you know, how do we do that? And what are the potential costs? I can tell you that if we're weighing green up and clean up versus performance and return, you need not give up one for the other. You can have both of those things if they're both important. Um, and then, you know, if we wanted to do that, I have some thoughts about divestment versus engagement and what is how you feel about how things are versus what the impact is. And you're not one person. So it's going to be, you'll, I'm sure there'll be some discussion as to what does the board care about, if anything. Um, and then, you know, in, in terms of the, the purpose of the money, everything that we do at Edward Jones is not around piles of money and watching them grow. It's about investing to a purpose, managing risk and reward to get to a goal. And so knowing what that goal is, is important for my job and being able to, to sort of guide and recommend for you. Um, does that serve well as a decent introduction? Yeah, 
Certainly. Mm -hmm. um, so, Mark, there, uh, we, uh, CJ has posted a, a question in the chat. I don't know if you have opened the chat capacity, oh. on, but if you want to, you can see which the question that she's put in there. Okay, hold on. Okay, so um, in terms of inflation, I mean, I think that how uh, transitory the this inflation is depends largely on the color of the news that you watch and follow. Um, it it is as high as it's been since I think the last time it was this high was uh, during Reagan's second year or third year, um, and. But, but I don't think that our view is not that inflation is running away and that we are expecting to see the sort of stagflation of what we saw in the 70s. There are too many other sort of unique circumstances surrounding why inflation is this high. A lot of it has to do with um, uh, supply chain issues, obviously the pandemic, obviously there was very low inflation in previous years and massive growth because of stimulus money being put into the economy. And now that the stimulus money is drying up and we're sort of returning back to more normal things, um, we're seeing, I mean, the inflation numbers you see now are not based off of a 10 year trend. They're compared directly to 12 months ago. So we're coming off of very low numbers to very high numbers. Um, I'd like to say we've We've seen the worst of it, but honestly, I have no idea. If I could tell you, then I would have a different job. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd be working for Jerome Powell or somebody like that. I don't know. Um, in terms of what you can expect from your portfolio, I mean, I think that Jones says in a 50-50 portfolio, Something like four and a half to six and a half percent is a reasonable expectation. Um, what I can tell you is that since January 1st of 2009, the portfolio that you have has returned an average annual return of, sorry, Rob and Rachel are the only authorized people on this account. Am I free to just speak openly about the contents? Okay. Um, uh, you've seen an average annual return of 7%, which this month, uh, was the first time we we got to an inflation number like that. So over the long term, I don't think that that inflationary number is going to matter. Your your portfolio is going to keep up with and outpace inflation during most times. Inflation historically has not been this high. It's been an average of about 3% for roughly the past 100 some odd years. So sometimes it spikes up high and sometimes it's crazy low. Does that answer your question? To some extent, it does. Um, this is CJ. The, the, the extraordinary circumstances of a global shutdown of the global economy um, and then the supply chain uh, shortages that resulted from companies trying to manage a, a genuine shutdown seem substantial. I am getting reports uh, because I am, because one of my other things is I support a large group of people trying to maintain aircraft. The, uh, the shortage situation seems to be getting worse, not better. Um, and just for an example, uh, trucks, airplanes, everything wanting a filter is currently starting to get backed up behind the fact that most of the filter makers started making masks. Um, so the, this combination of this enormous increase in the money supply without any apparent uh, actual, <laughs> just sort of like here, we need to create a lot of money because we're going to do a lot of investing and, in, you know, in, in, in making vaccines and things like that and, and making sure they get out to everybody uh, combined with this. Um, so, so this big increase in the money supply and then this huge stopping of, um, of the normal production of, of materials. It's, I just, it's, it's really created an extraordinary situation. Um, I think that the portfolio has done well under Mike's and your, uh, and, and Rob's governance, but it's just a new situation that really, I think is gonna require some careful thinking. And, uh -huh. and I'd be interested in your views. Sure, um, I, I'm gonna give you what may seem like an oversimplistic answer, but when inflation runs away, 
what are we talking about? We're talking about prices at the grocery store going high, prices of gas at the pumps going high, Coca-Cola is more expensive. Everything you buy is, is, is more expensive. So out of the portfolio that you have, 50% of it is invested in companies like, it's all mutual funds. So you own hundreds of companies, right? No, no single, no individual stocks, but you own plenty of Coca-Cola and Johnson & Johnson and Boeing, Airbus, McDonald's, Nike, Procter & Gamble, et cetera. So as the price of soap goes up, you're going to feel that as, an, as a consumer, but Procter & Gamble is also going to raise their prices to keep up. Coca-Cola will raise their prices, et cetera. So by investing in those companies, I mean, you can be sure that those companies are going to make money. Um, if McDonald's and Coca-Cola and Procter, Procter & Gamble were to collapse, then well, not to be too glib about it, I think we would have far bigger problems than the value of our portfolios. We'd all be worried about our neighbors coming to steal our heating oil. Um, you know, I mean, it, it would, it, it, not to hyperbolize, but it would be a sort of more dire situation. More to the point of what we should do, um, I think that with a 50-50 portfolio, that's fairly conservative already. It's neither aggressive nor conservative. And over the long term, over five years and 10 years and 20 years, all of this will be a historical blip. So trying to readjust dramatically in the short term for the news that's coming out now or what we think may happen in the coming months, when we try to guess, we guess wrong as often as we guess right. And I'm talking about we, the human animal. So the better strategy is to um, invest for a low, with a long-term focus, with a purpose in mind, and know that even if the market is turns down horribly in 2022, that that's part of the that's part of the plan. That's part of the 10-year focus. In any 10-year period, history will say that the markets are up six of those 10 years, down three of the 10, and flat one of those. So as long as we remain invested through the bad times and through the good times, then over the long term, we come out ahead every time. Yeah, and we've, we saw our portfolio bounce right back from the great recession of 0789, oh, um, you know, pretty markedly, actually. Um, Mark, I'd like to get back to your original, um, the original conversation you, you were um, Forwarding, have you done an analysis of just how much of our portfolio is quote unquote dirty or fossil fuel um, tied? And, and if we wanted to move into a greener portfolio, what percentage of parts we'd be needing to move? How much just how, how much surgery would that entail? Have you, have you done any of that? Sure. So uh, what, what I haven't done is I can't tell you of your total portfolio, how much of it is, in, is invested in fossil fuels, for example. But I can tell you of the funds that you have, individually, we can, we can identify how much fossil fuel is in there, how much prison industrial complex or um, uh, civilian firearms, military weapons, tobacco, et cetera. So th that is one part of the process. For me, the process that I use is that first, I wanna see, do these, do these things perform well. If they don't perform well, then it sort of doesn't matter how clean they are, sort of. For some people it may, but as I said, I don't think you have to choose one or the other. So the second part of the process is to identify what's it, what it's invested in. And then and I, I can I'm happy to to share some of share my screen and show you a little bit of that if you'd like. Um, but then how much you want to do, I'm not I don't have a proposal for you now because I'm not sure what it is you guys do or don't care about, right? For example, if you, if you as a group or as an organization care deeply about fossil fuel exposure and not at all about military weapons, then I'm going to go and build a proposal based off of your values. And those are the consensus values as well. And we, we would be at the very beginning of that conversation. Sure. So my hope today was to just start get you started on that conversation regardless of what your answer is i don't really have an agenda uh with you other than 
to help you make sure your investments are in line with your values as an organization. Okay, whatever those values are, that's up to you. Um, but if you'd like, I will show you um, something. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Good. So I've pasted into the chat, fossilfreefunds.org. It is a nonprofit third party. They're not beholden to any of the mutual fund companies or any of the investment houses or anything like that. And you can, from your statement, you can take any of those funds that you're invested in, plug them in there, I will tell you, if it's a bond fund, it's probably not going to show up. They just don't show up well in these tools because bond funds are typically invested heavily in treasury bonds and things like that. It's They're harder to evaluate in that way. But it will show you a lot, and then you guys can discuss that. I think that's a great idea. And these, these are common ethical bins in terms of firearms and prison industrial and fossil fuels, and that's kind of the – those are the common bins in terms of ethical – um investing yes so go ahead yeah so what you'll find in that site is just a way for you to determine your exposure to those particular risk factors right it's by no means saying that that's all that there is um i will say that the gender equality metric while very a very important issue is a problematic metric because it relies so much on self-reporting everyone has amazing memos and policies in place to prevent this kind of nonsense, but everybody sucks on transparency and accountability, right? The others are straight up math. And you'll see if you have more than 9% invested in fossil fuels or fossil burning utilities, then you get an F, right? So that they're, they're very objective in that way. I would, I would urge you, if you see a grade you don't like, if you see an A or a B, it just means very little exposure to that sector. If you see a grade you don't like, click on it and it will take you, it'll dig down into it and it'll tell you what companies are they and why. And so sometimes you're gonna see, oh, you got a C for prison industrial complex. And you go and you look at why, and it's because, well, that fund has Amazon and Microsoft in it. So if you're unwilling to own Amazon and Microsoft, it's gonna be very hard to build a portfolio that cooks, it's possible for sure. It's just a lot more work. So you go explore and let me know what's important to you. And then I'll go to work for that. Thanks. Yep. Great. A question for you, um, partly because uh, I posted into the chat window a request to look at human rights. Um, and to me, that includes the gender equality category. What you said was extremely helpful about the lack of transparency and accountability. Um, goes right to the point are there any but it is an issue that i think is is relevant um again i'm sensitive to the fact that i just had somebody who's in a you know kind of a protected class talk to me about having tried to present to a different board a pattern of of issues and this is a company that's been around since 1973 and the board jeered at the person and then sent to investigate one of the people that jeered <laughs> Um, is there, now this is a, a, a non-stock, a, a charitable company, and so it's not reporting, it's not, wouldn't be part of our, our, our portfolio, but is there um, any metric that we as a board, if we decide that this is something relevant to us, that we as, a, is there anybody or, you know, that looking at some kind of a metric to, to look at that kind of thing? Are they legitimately committed to, you know, uh, creating a friendly workplace where there's an equal opportunity situation, where there's a real chance to, you know, try to, to get stuff improved. So that's an excellent question. And I'm going to give you a very disappointing answer of no, there is no, there is no industry wide standard that holds everybody to the same criteria. And that's, it's a problem in the industry. It is improving, has been improving for 30 years. All I can say is if you're gonna live in America and pay taxes and use the US dollar, then in some way you are a contributor to whatever problem it is that you perceive. So all we can try to do is be better, be better than we were before, work in the right direction. This is my personal philosophy now I'm sort of giving you. We're never going to be perfect. 
So all we can try to do is work in the correct direction and try to be better. I will say there is there are there's a lot of talk about the effectiveness of divesting, saying I'm not going to invest in this company because they are bad, and engaging. So there are in fact mutual fund companies because you you can say well I'm not going to invest in in any oil companies because but that's like you saying I'm not going to use single use plastic. And that's terrific. But as one person, you have a very small impact. We have to have everybody doing that for it to be truly meaningful, right? And still somebody out there is going to make single-use plastic. Sorry, I'm going to get on a soapbox. Please knock me off whenever you need me to. Um, but so, so in divesting in that way has a small impact, but we feel very good about our choices. A perhaps more meaningful way to affect real change is by proxy voting because every one of these public companies has shareholder resolutions and shareholder meetings. And so unless you are going to pay attention to every vote that comes up and go and actively vote and have billions of dollars where your vote means something, it's gonna be very difficult. So by there's a collective power, however, in using mutual fund companies that you know are gonna vote in line with your values. And there are a few of them but these companies very often have excellent performers. They are engagement focused. So they have a mission um, that is to say, we may invest in this company that is doing harm because they have a hope of being pulled in the right direction. So we're going to buy that. We're going to vote that. And we're going to steer that company in the right direction. That may be a, gr a, gr a way to have greater impact. So after you guys decide what is and isn't important to you, I'll come back to you with ways that we can either avoid companies we don't like or use fund companies that we know are going to be in line with what we're trying to do. And then we will put together something that allows us to be a little bit better than we were before and move in the right direction. How does that sound? Sounds great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just that quick question. It's Dave. Yep. <clears throat> Mark, things, how fast could things change? So for instance, Washington Post just put out an amazing study of mental health people in prisons today, I think it was yesterday. And if we wanted to divest from the prison industrial complex, how long would it take us to move out of that, you know, and emphasize the other ones that we are believing in? Assuming that we knew where we wanted to go to, if I had that lined up for you right now, two days. Okay, thanks. Carlos, is that an old hand up or is that a hand up, a fresh hand up on your uh, icon there? No, that, that was before, that was an accident. Before, thanks. Thank you. Mark, I was just thinking about our mission as a media company, community media. I, you know, I don't, I don't know if there are, um, if, if our investment strategy could somehow, you know, we could put our money on, quote unquote, the good guys in the media world, or if, if there are any metrics in, uh, I guess, information technology, just our wheelhouse in terms of ethics. Um, it's not one I've heard of, so I'll just throw that at you. So what I will tell you is that in the world of what's called ESG investing, that's environmental, social, and governance conscious investing, not all companies are evaluated by the same criteria. For example, a bank, I mean, they could they could run calculations and computers and run funds all over the place. They're never going to create nearly the amount of carbon emissions that Ford Motor Company creates in a month, right? Just by nature of the product that Ford creates, the process it takes to manufacture, et cetera. So you can't really evaluate those two in the same way. However, Ford Motor Company may have a lot less risk exposure to things like data breaches and privacy concerns with client information. So, you know, the Bank of America is going to be uh, evaluated much more heavily on those social considerations than on environmental considerations. They're both going to be evaluated on governance, which is the, the makeup of the board, that is gender equality, that is uh, racial equity, um, just representation in general. Um, so sorry, that, I, that doesn't really answer your question, except that your companies that are in your wheelhouse would be evaluated 
compared to other companies in that wheelhouse, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, Mark, I just had a question. I, I think we're getting ready to wrap up here. Okay. Uh, just so you know, we typically take these meetings and do turn them around and put them on our actors channel and on our YouTube channel. I don't know if you have any guidance. Do you feel that there was anything in tonight's conversation that should not be public? Or if there's a... Uh, um, the only thing that might be problematic from a compliance standpoint is um, me. Good thought. Um, final questions for Mark or, or just... And a thank you. No, Sue's up. Um, before you go, could you tell us about your uh, Broadway career? <laughs> so you've done your research. I just um, looked you up. <laughs> sure. Uh, I, was, uh, I was in The King and I from 1997 to 1998 at the Neil Simon Theater. Um, it was my first big gig right out of college. I learned a lot. It was terrific. It, uh, I mean, it, lots of memories, but it did not have nearly the impact on my formation as an artist and a person as many smaller downtown gritty weird productions that I was in. <laughs> Did you cut your hair off for that performance? Say again? Cut your hair off to be the king? Um, ironically, I, I had cut it off for a different show years before and the king in that production had hair and they wanted me to grow it back. And that's when I learned that not all of my hair was going to grow back. So <laughs> they let me keep it bald in spite of the fact that that was the Yul Brenner look. Yeah. Sorry about the intrusive question. <laughs> yeah, well. Susan, that was great. Yeah, that was the year I faced my own mortality. <laughs> <laughs> and very appropriate given that we are a media company and committed to community media. So delighted to have you as our new um, investment guide. Yeah. Well, and great. a very, I... very interesting discussion. I learned a lot. I'd be happy to come back anytime. I appreciate the opportunity to serve and thank you for the time today. May I ask an inappropriate question because really this is a board decision, but hypothetically, if we do end up, uh, when we talk about new business in our, or our old business in our meeting, uh, if we do end up making the skills of the board and the uh, parts and work of media available, uh, do you have any interest if, if the board agrees that if we do that? because your uh, discussion strikes me as information that is not available to all Vermonters and they might very much like having the opportunity to uh, learn from you. Um, I, there would be a lot of compliance hoops to jump through, but I'd be happy to serve in whatever way is helpful to the community. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for making the time, Mark. My pleasure. Uh, I'm gonna jump out now. Yeah, yeah, okay. and we'll, uh, we'll make some time, perhaps even next board meeting, to chew on some of those sort of ethics bins and see if we've got consensus on, uh, we may go in 20 different directions, who knows, but thank you for laying out a way to think about the issues. Sure, and uh, Rob knows how to get me. If you have any other questions, call me anytime. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Good night, everybody. Sorry, Mark. Good night, Good night and thank you. That so, us. Rob, go ahead, Carlos. Rob. I, I made a note, Rob, for you here in the presentation to see what you want to do with that editing out to edit out the parts that need to be edited out, or if you want to edit the whole thing out. I don't know. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yep. That'll roll us into the financial reports. Uh, Mike Doyle, our treasurer, is not here tonight, so um, Rob will um, give us the financial reports and then. Um, roll into the executive director's report. So Rob, you've got a sustained holding of the floor here. Thank you for that. That sounds daunting. Huh? That sounds daunting. Oh, you're a pro, come on. <laughs> uh, just uh, so typically Mike would give the balance uh, of what we have in the accounts at the bank. We uh, hold our accounts at Community National Bank here. Uh, uh, and we have four accounts. One of them is tied to the PayPal account, which uh, currently has $3,049.54, uh, um, which is up because of that. Most of that money came from the um, camps of Crystal Red this summer. So we, you know, there is the ability to transfer that into other accounts. I haven't done anything, it's just been sitting there. 
uh, our checking account currently has uh, $8,966.07. This is our general operating day-to-day uh, -day operations checking account. So I periodically keep it around that five dollars to $15,000 and replenish it as needed for expenses for the operation. We do have a savings $8, account. 66 and seven cents. Yep. Got it? Got it. So yep. the, the savings account is where we, which is different than the reserve that Mark was talking about. So this, that's the portfolio. In our general savings account, we have $157,605.52. That's one fifty seven six zero five and 52 cents, Carlos. Got it. And then our last one is that one that I established this summer for to hold money for the documentary Youth Lab that Christopher did. Mm -hmm. And that currently has $24,000, 24, 390 and 76 cents. And I meant to add all that up to tell you how much we have in the bank right now, but I did not do that. But <laughs> somewhere around 250, 200 something plus. Uh, that is the balance. And then uh, I typically will go through the budget versus actual report which is one that I compile out of our QuickBooks account. Uh, so this one is the one, the final, well, it's not final. I said this in my uh, report that there may be a few transactions that come in over the course of the next few weeks. Um, but this is a pretty accurate representation of what happened last year. Uh, in general, I tend to be very conservative in our income. And so that shows up in the fact that we got a little bit more money than I had budgeted for uh, to the tune of, $63,000 over budget. Um, some of that is capital gains. So that's the, that capital gains at 4,800 that you see there. Uh, it is just what's in the reserve. So that's how much money we made over the course of the year on the at Jones account. Uh, so I typically don't look at that in my budget. So I, I would take that away from the 63,000 say, and say that within our budget, we probably came up with about, uh, it's about half, so 30,000. So about another $30,000 over uh, what we had budgeted in 2021. And then on the expenses side, um, we did come in under uh, for a lot of it. Uh, and this has been, been conservative. Uh, the pandemic itself has uh, cut into our expenses as far as personnel in that we have not had to send camera operators out to all our municipal meetings. So we've been getting a lot of the stuff that are hybrid. So every time we do a hybrid meeting, it can be taken care of by staff here at the facilities uh, and can actually be run by Zach and Jen and get five meetings going at once as opposed to having five people out in the field. So we did were able, I mean, we did see some cost drops because of that. One uh, thing that did increase because of that is the unemployment taxes. A number of our part-time staff camera operators did apply for uh, unemployment insurance. And as I understand it, when you uh, sign up for unemployment insurance, you can either pick to pay a regular amount or you can say zero. And then when unemployment comes up, you pay the whole thing. And that's what we did. Since we typically don't have unemployment, we were at the we had chosen to do the zero, and then we would pay it. So even if we, people who are uh, do sign up for unemployment, we are paying that for them as well anyway. So that's why you see a significant increase in the unemployment taxes that we pay of two hundred. You know, the last row tells you what we're uh, what percentage of the budget we are on. So that's why you see that two hundred sixty one percent. You know, it's about twenty five hundred dollars uh, over what we had budgeted in twenty twenty one. Uh, health insurance can be variants. I think that that was a significant drop in that uh, some staff um, dropped uh, family from it. Uh, we do pay 80% of staff and family. Uh, and some of our staff are single and some people have family. So that can fluctuate. We try to make our best guess uh, on that. Uh, Pension Express, I guess, went up a little bit. I didn't really dig into, you know, it's not much as $440. Legal fees, we put it $3,000 in there. Uh, we didn't have anything legal that we really dealt with in 2021. So that's why it's significantly less than what we had budgeted. Um, subcontractors is uh, what we usually pay. We have one person who does uh, local sports uh, through his business, uh, Central Vermont Sports. His name is Carl Parton. Uh, and I think that in looking at how we pay him, um, I did decide that the best way to consider him is as a subcontractor because he's really in looking at how the, um, I think the forget several government would classify subcontractors, people that would typically do work outside. Uh, so I think um, that's where I came up with looking at the criteria, we came up with defining uh, Carl as a subcontractor. 
Uh, that may be, you know, that was a decision I made probably eight years ago. That may needs to be looked at. I mean, we are maybe sponsors of his work, uh, but that's where you'll see that that money is. So it's really that $1,900 is going towards Carl Parton and his local coverage of sports. Um, and then, so most of the other ones here are, are uh, just about coming up at 100%. You know, they, as I said, I tend to be conservative when I pin my budget. Uh, and so they came in under. So um, workers' comp was up a little bit. Um, outreach was a little bit higher. So we, I think that is probably mostly due to we now have access to the electronic programming guide. This is a, a fight that we had for many years with the appeal company and getting access. So if you have cable, you'll, you can go to the program guide. Uh, and they did not want us to have access to that, uh, largely due to the, the fact that it was difficult in that um, it's defined by their head ends, which is the, the hub of where all the, all the content comes in. So HBO comes in and WCAX and us all come to the head end and then get that gets distributed out to the cable lines. So each head end uh, is sort of where they would look at the programming for a particular one. Ours is located in Berlin, but we do share that head end with uh, the access center up at Hardwick. Uh, and I think even maybe Mooresville. So the difficulty was that you couldn't separate at the time, it was channel 15, 16, and 17. So there were three different autonomous channel 15s. So in the negotiations with the cable company, we had to get to an agreement to say that we would take different numbers, uh, channel numbers. So uh, we, they put us up in the 1000s. So now we are now channel 1035, 1085, and 1095. Uh, Hardwick maybe uh, 1080. Uh, and I forget what Green Mountain Access is. In, in, Mooresville is, but now since they are completely different, now we can have the access to listings, but we pay for those listings for each channel, which is about $105 per month per channel. So that's about $350 per month to be able to send our uh, listings to the company. I forget, uh, forget the grace notice the name of the company that handles that most of the bigger uh, cable companies. But it was a, a hard fought battle. We did want to be able to uh, say that people are looking for us and particularly with DDR, if somebody wanted to DDR the, the local city select board or uh, city council meeting, they are now able to do that in the, that in Xfinity platform for people who do have cable at home. So that was a big thing, but it did bring up, we had to pay for it and we had to move our channels. How much lead time do you have to give them to have your schedule uh, correct? So I would check with Jin on that, but I think uh, we are, you know, we had, that was one of the problems with that our access centers are typically scheduling just like maybe a few days out of, or maybe a week. The grace note would uh, appreciate, I think, looking at two or three weeks out. So I think that's where about Jin is, is that she's about, she'll start her scheduling and, and uh, it will be out looking out two or three weeks. So the grace note has it. You know, they, you know, in the negotiations, they said if you did have a change, you could get it to us maybe within a day or two to change something. But they really do want to sort of populate that uh, in a, a few weeks in advance. So the world publishes this. Yeah, that's a week in advance. So the Argus wouldn't do this. The Argus, uh, you know, we. I'm sorry. I, I, no, no, it's a, it's a. The Argus did have a block of a TV, and a, and they have their weekend thing. Uh, uh, and then we happened to notice that we were no longer in that, and we'd been paying for uh, access to this company that was out of Canada in Ontario. So we dropped that and shifted to the great store because you know uh, we think that uh, more people are going to be looking at their uh, their program guide on their on their uh, with their remote than pulling it from the supplement. You know, there are certain people that still do that. I'm one of the paid yeah. people. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so. <clears throat> See, we've got down to outreach and advertising, mm, educational development. These are places that we did save some money. To, those are things for like conferences. If we send the staff to a conference, uh, and that, you know the registration for the conference would be under educational development. Travel expenses would also will be in there if they have to fly somewhere or go somewhere. Um, and because of COVID, there haven't been those many conferences. That, you know, we do anticipate that this year there will be. Uh, and I do have it on my notes for my executive director to talk about some of the conferences that are ha happening and uh, plans to attend. Uh, but that's where we've had savings in 2021. Um, and mileage as well. We do pay our staff, the camera operators who go out into the field, mileage at the IRS full rate. So, uh, you know, that can um, be money for them, particularly people who 
we may be driving as far south as Rochester, which is one of our, our furthest southern town. And I think it's an hour a drive down. So that could be a, a sizable piece of money when they actually total up their, their mileage and stuff like that. Uh, the youth documentary lab is also in there. Um, and we did a report on that uh, in December on, I think on that. So it came out to be a, 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 a a good program that made some money mostly through the after school uh, uh, grant that Christopher got. So, uh, interest expense, website project, capital expenditures, we were a little bit low on that. So, I think, you know, in general, we, we did a pretty good job on the on the budget. So, I don't know if you guys have any questions or budget questions, financial questions. Rob is fielding them after his presentation. Is Mike Doyle still in the run? I mean, is he doing okay? Uh, I talked to him to, uh, today. Yeah. He seems to be doing fine. Okay. Good. Yeah. I'm going to make sure. He just uh, he asked that I call him the day beforehand so that we can get a reminder. And uh, him. Okay. I said I put it on my list that I would make sure to reach out to him today in advance. But we sort of had his evening planned all the way. So that's good. And he seems to be experienced. He did talk to me last week. He's working with the histor historical. He's trying to get some help applying to nonprofit status. And I've done it. 1023 a couple times, so I shared what all I have. All right. Other than actually, I shared get an account and get a letter. <laughs> Good to hear he's doing fine. Um, more questions on the financials, and or I could accept a motion to uh, I could receive a motion to accept these financial reports. Um, yeah, I'll put that in my report about the, the one for the extra money. <clears throat> um, just Rob, so if we come in over on income by 63000 and under on expenses by 37000 that is uh, net 100000 adding those two numbers. Yeah. Um, but as I said, I'd probably pull right. 30000 out of that as capital gains, and that, and that would sort of be separate. Because we don't really deal with that the day to day operations. So I would think, I think it's more of a $70,000. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so we can move on to the my report. Yeah, I don't think we need to accept the financials as a separate, especially since you're one entity. Okay. Is that, is that fair, everyone? We'll just roll right into the executive director's report. Seeing no objection, Rob, you continue to hold the floor. So um, there's not much I think we historically, uh, sorry, I do think we historically moved to accept the financials and so may as well stay with the uh, with president. I, uh, also move. CJ has moved to accept the financials. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Thank you, uh, Rachel. Uh, moved and seconded to accept the financial reports. Please indicate by saying aye. 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 And opposed? Thanks for keeping us clean, CJ. That's unanimous approval of the uh, financials. And now, Rob, you can uh, pick up the executive director's report. Thank you. Um, so, um, as uh, well, most of you know, and I'll, I'll, you know, some of this is for the new board members, uh, we get most of our funding from cable subscribers uh, in the 14 towns that we serve. And we get that as a quarterly check from Comcast. So. Uh, that is our sort of measurement of just what we're seeing in fluctuation as far as cable subscribers go. Uh, and we do, I'm sure you, as you have heard us talk about, we anticipate that cable revenue will start to decline as younger people come up who are not watching cable. So we, we keep an, a close eye on that check to see it. It's been very flat for a number of years. Um, although uh, there was a slight increase from 2020 to 2021. And a lot of this came about because we we're actually going to the state house and to the legislature for an appropriation to help support the work that um, the access centers do across the state. The Vermont Access Network is the association of access centers across the state, uh, commonly referred to as VAN. I do serve on the board of directors of VAN uh, and uh, also on the advocacy committee, which has been working, uh, VAN did uh, enlist the services of a group called Action Circles, which is who, uh, whose director is Amy Schillenberger. Uh, 
who is uh, taking us through how the state house works. And she's been a godsend in just sort of understanding the machinations and how to be able to promote and advocate for us. So this is the first time, I mean, that we did uh, ask for a, a legislative report, which did require a $100,000 appropriation to hire a consultant to look at sustainability uh, in, in long-term senses of where money might be able to come from uh, as cable revenue be, uh, anticipates the decline. So that was a, a, something that was funded by the legislature. This year, we actually went to ask to support the actual program services of access centers across the state. And we uh, decided to go with a, uh, a $300,000 ask in fiscal year 2022, which is an adjustment that they did, would have to do. So they look at the beginning of this legislative session, they take a look at any budget adjustment that they may wanna make in the 2022 fiscal year. Uh, and in that budget adjustment, uh, we asked for $300,000, which uh, we got uh, testimony in from many people in the Bantam meeting and work uh, was well represented uh, at the first round with Pat McDonald's as a local producer here. Uh, she has a so-called vote for Vermont. Uh, and I asked her if she would testify. We were looking for five or so people to be able to, to go to the public hearing. Pat showed up and other people from the band community showed up. Uh, and we've also been doing some relationship building with the legislature. So, you know, we identify the legislature's key individuals in the legislature who are on the, the appropriate committees. Uh, and so, and then identify which access center has a relationship with that person. So I've been talking to uh, Mary Hooper, who is the rep for Montpelier, as well as uh, Ann Cummins, the senator on the Senate Finance, and just making sure they're aware of I ask, seeing if they'll support it. Uh, and it went very well when it actually got to committee. Uh, the committee approved it without any debate at all. They just said yes, $300,000. Uh, and it looks very good for us. Uh, I had a meeting with the band board this meeting uh, this morning, and I think there uh, there's one little change that you know through it, and it's like one little change in, in the in the in the language can throw it off. So it's not done. It's not a done deal yet, but we do look think that we're going to get three hundred thousand dollars, and then we have to get into dist distribution. So there's been a big discussion in the band community about um, how to distribute this fairly. Um, if we are going to the legislature asking for uh, to help people who are seeing decline, there are there's a variance across the van community. Some uh, are seeing a decline in their revenue. Some have not seen that decline. Uh, I think, as I said, I thought we were very flat. We actually saw an increase. Uh, it was decided in the interest of simplicity to just split it equally amongst the, the 24 active centers to just split that $300,000 equally. Uh, and this would help because that money is not as much, is more important to the smaller centers. So if they're getting, which is 300,000 divided by 24, came out to 12,500 from each access center. So the smaller access centers, that would mean a lot to them because it's a bigger percentage of their annual budget. So we thought that that, that alleviated the sort of like, you know, distribution equally. If they're not, it's not proportional based on your budget. It's just every access center gets it. Smaller centers will see a bigger piece. So that's what the band board decided to, to do. They are, uh, and just so you, in the 2023, um, fiscal budget, which is now being done and which Mike testified at as well. So uh, and, uh, work was well represented again. And, and uh, we're hoping that that ask will get in the 2023 budget of $600,000. Uh, and we anticipate that, you know, as we get into these more appropriations for van and for the access centers, uh, coming up with a, how do we distribute that in a way that uh, represents uh, the, sort of the ideas of what we're talking about. So that is a big discussion in the, in the community, but we're going to see soon, hopefully a check for $12,500. Did you have to go back to the appropriations committee and explain that's how you're going to do it? So in all of our conversations, we're talking about this idea of bridge funding. You know, we, we do anticipate that there'll have to be some sort of policy change in how, the, how we're financed. And that report that had, was done looked at the different ways of doing that. But we're, that's a longer, harder conversation. So this is sort of bridge funding for the next three years we anticipated. You know, we'll ask for 300 this year, uh, 600 next year, and it'll get to like a million in 2024. I just think by the fact that we, you did it what you did and the way that you emphasized it and the way that the smaller places could still benefit. And it wasn't because of Burlington, you know, Rutland uh, first. Uh, I think that's a good example to all the legislators yes. and to the state. So yeah. I think we should feature that. Yep. Um, that division. Yeah. And the ability to work. I together. think that uh, you know 
we're maybe a little ahead of the game, and maybe yeah. we wanted to jinx it by talking about this when mm -hmm. we haven't actually <clears throat> gotten it. But yeah, that's a, you know that's a, I think that's going to be valid and part of the and and that would be it in I think in discussions with the Department of Public Service, which is the one who would actually we would invoice and or they would invoice on our behalf, and then we would get the check here. And it might be that some of the ones that are farthest out, including far away from things like coverage and the internet. Um, might give a thank you note to ban and send that to their legislators yeah. uh, because they split evenly uh, okay. money. I will certainly bring that to the app okay. uh, committee yeah, and, and see and make sure actually will think that's a great idea. So, so yeah. the, the 300 and the 600 uh, are decisions that are made separately. Yes. Are they made, well, how much lag times between those two decisions? Uh, well, uh, so we're hoping that in the next few weeks, the 300,000 will get decided. The, the 600,000 uh, probably could go to the end of the legislative yeah, session. session. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Other uh, questions uh, generally, the executive director's report, or stay honed in on the, the uh, state ask? Uh, well, I, I do have some other things to talk about. Sure, sure, yeah. Uh, so uh, other things to talk about. Uh, um, are the conferences that I was talking about. So uh, I do serve on the Alliance for Community Media, which is the national advocacy group for access centers across the country. Uh, and there are regional boards. I'm not on the, the national board, but I am on the regional board, uh, which uh, covers uh, the six states, New England and New York. And they are having their conference uh, at the end of March in Providence, Rhode Island. <clears throat> and I know Michael wanted to go there, but he's not unable to go. Oops, yeah. But you're you'll represent. I actually am the conference chair, committee chair, so <laughs> I am will be there, and we are now at the point where we're having a regular week of things to plan the conference. I have asked staff if any of them are. Christopher did say that he might be interested in one, so uh, so there might be some money that's going to go into that for that. You know, so we we have it in the budget for for some of those things. The national uh, uh, conference is will be held, I believe, in person. So this is the first year that we're going back to in person conferences. Uh, is going to be in Chicago in the summer. So that might be something that I would look to attend as well as maybe bringing one staff or a board member if there's a board member that might be interested in going. And CJ's hands up. Yeah. Hey, CJ. CJ, yes. Uh, thank you. The uh, Well, two things. Um, I have two questions. And before that, uh, if uh, you're interested and if it's proper for a board member to attend the Providence Regional Meeting, I, I'd be interested in going if schedule permits. Um, so uh, let me know. And then uh, my second question is uh, related to something we've discussed in the past, which is using um, streaming revenues to support ORCA. Obviously, we haven't seen the precipitous fall in revenues that we expected, but we do think that they will be coming. Um, has there been any movement on that, first of all? Well, that, a lot of that is the, the policy discussion that I'm sort of talking about. About is that you know if we're going to change the regulatory structure and how access is funded, uh, obviously that looking at the streaming revenue, which is where we're seeing the money move from from cable subscribers to people who subscribe to streaming services. Um, yes. You know, it does. You know, there that's a big discussion that's happening on a local level as well as on a national level, and there are regulators who all play into that, including the federal government, the FCC, the local government, uh, and that was. Um, at, there are, you know, there is some talk about that. There is a bill now, I think, in Massachusetts that is uh, looking to take that on as well as Maine. So we're all keeping an eye on what's happening individually at the states. Um, there is some hope maybe on, on the federal level. I think that uh, we did see uh, the president appoint new FCC commissioners uh, who are, uh, uh, we are hopeful are, that are friends and stuff like that. So. Uh, you mean not completely in the pocket of the large uh, carriers? So I would say that, you know, I don't know that I have news other than it's, it's constantly being talked about, CJ. It's well, did the, did this, Vermont, the state commission that was funded to look at different revenue streams, was one of them like an entertainment tax yeah. that would, would hit streaming? Yeah, or not as, or would be broader than that, or not as tailored. Or so I think there's a, I think it's the city of Chicago uh, has effectively tried to, to move an entertainment tax, and I believe this is a tax that from the days of traveling shows would be taxed when they came to town, 
And they were able to move that to the idea of uh, entertainment that's being delivered over streaming services. So there has been some examples of, of, of an entertainment tax. Uh, you know, whether or not that could fly. Uh, we, you know, in some of the work that, you know, the report that we had done, I think that the department was really uh, wary or cautious on some of the things and felt that some of it might be illegal within the statute that's- uh, This would be public service. Public service. Uh, but, and they kept pushing us to like, you, what your, your answer is to go to the legislature. And that's really what we've been focused on for the last year. Um, Meaning for specific finding money asks. Support. But we would rather see that as bridge funding to get us to a place where we're actually part of, uh, of a revenue stream that's yeah. built in like the cable. And there are, I think they, they went through the six or seven different sort of uh, areas and sort of mm -hmm. discuss the viability of each of those. So, yeah. And so, right, Rob, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. The, the reason I asked my question and keep bringing it up is because, um, so part of my background, as the old board members know, but the new board members don't, is I'm a former uh, chief information officer for Verizon's Global Optical Network and the former chief technology officer for Cable and Wireless Data Division, which is a uh, very old, large multinational carrier, uh, as well as doing some startups. And the... Um, the carriers and those that ride on that infrastructure, and I did some policy work with the DOJ and the European Commission, those carriers um, are really essential to uh, issues of privacy and equal access. And there is very little leverage for transparency. And um, so the there's a, a leverage point in the streaming question that for transparency. So I think that streaming shares are coming, but the, the way that that is done will have a lot to do with how much transparency they engender or they, they enable. Um, so if it, it, part of my interest in this has been the lack of transparency and the, the use or misuse of those media and um, so that that's my interest in that, and the reason I keep bringing the question up when it comes up. If yeah. it's possible to bring my background and skills to participate, um, I'd be happy to do so. Maybe they can be useful. It's kind of, um, I just have some insight into how things work both technically and, and, uh, and from a regulatory standpoint that might be useful. Thank you, CJ. I'll keep that in mind for sure. I had a question about artists that have now been into the third year of not having a place to get gigs. I don't know whether there's any federal unemployment money that are available for artists. The arts councils try to support the artists whether or not they have gigs. I'm just trying to, the reason I'm bringing it up is it may be something that we might want to try to do, which would be offer for people that have lost most of their income to be able to say something and be interviewed and possibly show us what they what they can sing or what they can play. Um, it's a community service uh, and to help them keep their alive their 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 main existence alive rather than having to go off and, and you know carry tools to other people. Yeah I mean I think that <clears throat> we're slowly coming out of it. I think that the venues for the performers are actually opening up uh, but I, I do think that there is an opportunity for us to think about how we can support, you know, we had talked about maybe even doing something live uh, from the studio here for performance and stuff like that. So I think that that's- yeah, I'd just like to keep that on a potential yeah. agenda. Appreciate that. Dave, you reminded me when I um, testified to the joint budget committee, I did mention that sort of the list of um, how work has been essential service during the pandemic is that we have assisted Nonprofits, arts groups like Lost Nation continue to have an audience remotely when they could not, you know, access live people. We, we've, done, we've done some of that, so I like how you're thinking. Um, <coughs> more items for your executive director. Last thing I would say uh, that I have is just to let you know that uh, we're going full bang, full gang bangers with the, the the programs for the summer. So we're getting advertising with, so we're trying to make sure that we have high exposure for the 
I believe that we have three programs listed uh, for the summer, which is an advanced documentary, an introduction to documentary, and then one is with images on producing here in the studio. So two two sessions, 15 to 19 year olds, and one session, 11 to 14. Yeah. And you so, you have a, you obviously submitted for the new grants they just announced this week. Yes, because first I got calls, I think, on the schedule, and I saw that he's on for that. Yeah. Okay. Yes, you should, hopefully, you're seeing it on social media if you're following our social media. Those those registrations are live. Yeah. I'm and supposed to reply to Chris's email. I've just wrote it down. I was like, you can see for the advanced documentary one. Good. It's right. Don't forget. Yeah, it'll be all hands on deck. I'm sure he'll, he'll circle back around for you. He doesn't hear from you. Good. Um, and that I would say is the conclusion of my executive director report. More questions for Robert or uh, entertain the acceptance of that report. I move to accept the uh, report. I accept and I second. Dave is uh, moved, so moved, and uh, Carlos has seconded that we uh, accept the executive director's report at eight o'clock on the nose. So we're doing all right time wise. Um, all those in favor of accepting the executive director's report, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. And opposed would be nay. I hear silence. I hear unanimous acceptance of the executive director's report. Um, that moves us to old business. And I do have a couple of items, but I, I will open the floor. If people have old business items. I have an old business question. Old business question, Dave. What what do are we doing, or what does the legislature need from us? Anything in terms of committee meetings, or public uh, meetings uh, being carried, uh, debates. I mean, is there anything that we do that we're going to continue to do, or that they are asking of us? Uh, Our legislature. Yeah, absolutely, all, all the time. I mean, okay. we, we are cranking out. The, the, the legislative coverage. So we're doing what they are expecting us to do and, oh, and they're pleased with yeah. it as far as we yeah. can tell. And that's, you know, that there is okay, just some to good um, relationship and good, uh, I think, capital that's being built with the legislators because they often recognize old media as the one that is in there. And they're going to be going back. I mean, I know that the House committees are there in person since it's going back. So, we're, you know, we're getting ready to send camera readers back into this house. So. Great. And, and if we get a wind of a public hearing, uh, I know that we got something from the governor's office about a press conference tomorrow that wasn't the standard weekly one. So we'll be streaming a live press conference. Uh, and I even forget what the topic is, but you know, they're, they're, they're beginning to recognize that, that as, a, as a resource and coming down. I'm glad. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, <laughs> CJ, is that an old hand up or a new one? It's an old hand up, although uh, I'm going to drop that, but uh, I did post some comments and questions into the chat window and the purposes for, for timeliness. Um, maybe I can just request that we consider them next time. Thanks, that's a good way to document it. Um, Dave, myself and Rob met around personnel and that creates some old business for HR training, looked into, signed up for. I did not sign up, I did look at that link that you gave me. So okay, um, so that I would say is you know we're due into in the past two into getting yeah um, that going um, and also updating the policies and procedures inclusive of a compensation policy within that document, which no doesn't even have a line item. I think it's from 2012. We it's a glaring yep. oversight, um, and that's a that's a gotta do old business. Yep. Thank you. Those, anything else come out of that personnel committee that felt like, yeah, that's an action item? I should have taken notes. Those are the two I recall. Um, and uh, actually, yeah, I'll, um, I'll toot a horn here. It's it's old business. So um, Randolph has a winter fest, it's about three years old. And uh, Carlos was involved in 2019, the first year that this, uh, Thing was launched. I'm sorry, it's 2020. It's February 2020, before the world shut down. A student from Carlos's film program um, <clears throat> captured it. He had a drone. It's beautiful footage. He was three quarters edited, and then in, in March, his uh, we all school shut down. Everything shut down. I remember how it was. 
So there is going to be a winter fest in two weeks in Randolph. Mark your calendars, the 26th. And Bryce, the student, is coming in Saturday to finally edit this two-year-old video. I, I asked IT and they dug it up last year. Um, so I'm just thrilled. Carlos, your hard drive is here waiting for you. The, uh, the footage is off the hard drive and it's, it's going to actually, two years in the making, literally. And I'll just turn that into, um, as CJ was mentioning earlier, <clears throat> I kind of shepherded this thing along. I would call myself the executive producer there. I would, I would say, hey, board members and also staff, the, the creative tools are, are at our hands. We've talked a lot about staff, about making creative works. Um, but if every board member just shepherded a little project, like one a year, that would just, it, I think it would enrich each individual and it would enrich Orca's offerings. And um, CJ, some of what you said earlier overlaps with that. So I just want to throw that out there. Um, just a seed planting, just general seed planting. I don't, I, we don't need to mention but it was incredibly rewarding to see this Winterfest video through. I That's just want to follow that Go up ahead, Dave. with a question about the Made Here series. They show up on public television all the time. Movies made here. It sounds like what you're talking about in Randolph could become a new Made Here movie if it's on the general television. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's actually looking good. We'll see. I mean, it's good. they're going to be short. They're little, yeah. little like promo videos. But um, yes. So they're just a general pitch. Um, and any other old business? Um, I will bring up one quick thing I texted Rob privately. Uh, we now have 90, as of Thursday night, 98 um, of a educational and safety series on uh, uh, airplanes in the can. Um, Thursday nights will be a pilot who was flying who lost his engine in hard we call hard IMC uh, and had a safe landing, but what happened to lead to that? We have a pretty active and well-respected well program with uh, VTC uh, in, in aviation education. Would there be interest in, uh, you guys had in, indicated some interest in carrying content. Is there interest in live streaming it on Thursday? Because this one will qualify for uh, VTCs. Uh, they're called wings and AMT credit. They're their uh, pilot and, and maintenance credits. But the second question is, um, do we want to go ahead and move that content onto, onto Orca? So, I mean, that is actually a decision for you to make, CJ. If, I mean, it is your channel. So if you'd like to hit the play, uh, I think your first question is with, as to whether or not to stream it. Uh, I'd be wary of that streaming. It actually does require additional resources as far as staff who has to watch it and make sure it goes. So um, we try to, to limit that to things that actually have a need as like a call-in thing or something like that, that or, or people who, uh, I mean, obviously some of the municipal things we do live, uh, you know, if we're doing something, uh, streaming it live, it would be because there's a reason to be, to be able to engage the audience at a time while it's happening. So. Yeah, no, my thought for streaming was really mainly because um, of the general interest and then the fact that, uh, given our educational mission um, and community mission that we might want to partner with the uh, VTC program. Okay, I'll take that offline. I don't know if this is, I will call this, I will call this new business because that'll move us down the agenda. Um, Perfect. I would just like to hope that we can finally have a, a, an open house here and perhaps the spring or early summer. Yeah. Um, so just which pigback pigtails, piggybacks, piggybacks on my new business, which is that uh, in the van board meeting this morning, they were talking about having their first in-person annual meeting. And we had planned on it in 2020 of having it and, and hosting it. Right. So they are moving forward with plans of us hosting it here in May. May 6th. So the scheduled May 2020 van meeting will now fi is finally rescheduled for May of 2022. Yes. That's kind of, you pick your days, like it's locked. So the day is locked. It's always the first Friday in May. Uh, so and it's, it's a day event. So uh, we reached out to the college uh, today to talk about, you know, could we do it here or, uh, you know, in the big room over across the way? Could we set up a tent out on the on the green, 
how can, do they are do they have a catering service that we could use because we do have to do lunch so uh, the beginning is the planning is beginning the six looks like the first friday in may is that ringing the bell yes. yeah that's wonderful to hear that's um, a great idea i think how many people would come if Van everyone was represented? So the numbers in the past years, they have grown to about 70 people. Wow. Uh, you know, so I didn't think, and so I, you know, I gave them a number of 50 to 60 because I think there maybe there's a some that are coming so far we need to house them overnight. Uh, no, I don't think so. They're okay. pretty used to driving, you know, uh, the ones that come from Bennington or Brattleboro. I guess that's uh, a long way. And now. we're centrally located. It's not like the, the last one we did, we did have in St. Albans. So, mm -hmm. so I think it's a, uh, beneficial that we're mm -hmm. in the middle of the state we should um, check and see what we're up against on that weekend yeah yeah um you're actually reminding me this may be under pipe dream but then new business but um it is looks like in vermont it's going to be a very active election here with house and senate federally opening up and i just kind of thought what if work and dcfa partnered for candidate forums in that lovely, that yeah. lovely space they have, um, it just seems like kind yeah. of a natural fit, and an election year would be really something. And I don't know if that's like if that's you know I gotta talk to, I don't know who my counterpart is at BCFA. I don't know if a staff to staff conversation like what would be the way in. But I'm happy to knock on the right doors. Way into use the to, to to create that sort of like a co partnership. Candidate forum for, you know, the Senate. See, that's kind of big. Well, so the House. I don't think that DCFA or Orca Media has the sort of um, moderator in in them. You know, uh, so we would probably look at some of the people that are doing, like Digger or maybe the Times Argus, uh -huh. and then offer our streaming and technical capacity. And DCFA could offer the facilities. You know, the actual location. Okay. So that would be, uh, you know, where I would be. So sort of needing a, 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 a third partner of professional journalist people. Yeah. Yeah. I so, guess you know, so it's you know it's so for you and it's term. early. I know it's only February, but it is we've got to get through the town yeah. meeting stuff now. Yeah. So then we just mayor month later. So Rob, for your information on May 6th, it's halfway between Mother's Day on Sunday and the National Day of Prayer on Thursday. Okay. So I just wanted to let you know what you're up against that weekend. All right, appreciate it. Other new business? I would just say much appreciation to Rachel and uh, Jack. Yeah. For joining us, and hopefully, you're not going to run around scared now as we had after right, right. seeing us in action. And speaking <laughs> of joining us, it looks like the, we, we do every other month. So we're looking at April 4th, Tuesday, would be the 26th at 6 30. If you can all mark your calendars, April 26th. 6 30 um four you said didn't you the oh, fourth, the fourth. fourth tuesday, tuesday is the 26th thank sorry. you thank you no i did say four and six in the same sentence um april 26 2022 at 6 30 i'm sure there'll be a remote option still um rob i don't it doesn't sound like there's a need for committee work in the off month in the march month but you know we stand at the ready i will yeah. if uh if ever that if, necessitates and uh if we're done with new business that means we're done with the agenda uh, i don't know entertain a motion to uh adjourn let's do it democratically i could slam the hammer down but hey anyone wanna how about one of the first and second second first and second come on motion to adjourn okay Rachel, motion to adjourn does anyone say chad second look at that they're all pros how quick all is in favor of adjourning at 8 13 not too bad please indicate by saying aye aye and opposed all right we have completed our good work here thank you for all your efforts uh this evening we got a lot accomplished uh Thanks, Mark, wherever you are. That was, a, we got a lot. We got a lot done. Thanks.